the prehistoric Aegean. The Aegean refers to the Aegean Sea, uh, which is a sea located right next to the Mediterranean. Geographically, we are between the area between Europe, Africa, and um, Asia Minor. This area eventually will be settled by the Greeks, but right now um, we're looking at, a, at the prehistoric Aegean uh, before the Greeks. There has always been a lot of interest in this because of Greek mythology and the stories of Homer. Uh, a lot of the ideas inherent in Homer's works uh, were derived from historical fact, although, uh, you know, whether there was a Trojan horse or uh, even an actual Trojan war in the way that it's described in Homer's epics, along with all of the heroes, Achilles, Ajax, Agamemnon, etc., etc., we don't know. However, in, in the 19th century, a guy named Heinrich Schliemann discovered uh, Troy. What was thought to be a, a fictional place was, was actually real. And he also discovered another place we'll, we'll be talking about specifically uh, later on in this lecture, uh, Mycenae. Certainly this spurred interest in this area in the, in the late 19th century with archaeologists coming to the Aegean to see if they can dig up uh, these Homeric history. And the first culture we're going to be studying is called the Cycladic culture, uh, named after a, a series of islands called the Cyclades, which is an extension of the Peloponnesian Mountains uh, going into the Aegean Sea. So these are basically underwater mountains whose tops are peeking out of the ocean of the sea forming islands. These islands are, are very mountainous. Uh, the, they're very rocky mountains. They're not really prone to uh, most kinds of agriculture. For the most part, this is a trading culture and a fishing culture. Um, they didn't leave behind any sort of large-scale buildings, but what the what the uh, cycladic culture did leave behind were uh, these interesting geometric shaped figures that were found in burial sites. Most of these, not all, but most of these are, are female figures. These figures would have been painted, so they look very sort of modern <laughs> to us now, like modern art, um, with their simplified forms, their geometric forms, uh, and this sort of whitewashed kind of appearance, but they would have had faces, uh, colorfully painted, eyes, lips, etc. Uh, these also would have been laid down in the grave, so they would have resembled corpses or dead bodies. Uh, there is an emphasis uh, on the breast and also an area we call the pubic triangle, so the triangle here of the genitalia. These were probably fertility figures. We're not 100% sure, uh, but w there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these that have been discovered over the years. There are some accounts of male figures. They're often shown sort of doing something, very often showing, um, as we see here, to be playing instruments. We have a guy playing a lyre. So we don't know if this was related to a funerary ritual, funerary rites, or ceremony. Uh, we just don't know. We're looking at art made around the time of the Great Pyramids here. Our next culture that we're going to be looking at is called the Minoan culture, uh, which is located mostly on the Isle of Crete. The um, Minoan culture is named after King Minos of um, the myth of the Minotaur from Greek mythology. Uh, this, uh, the Minoan culture was discovered by a guy named Sir Arthur Evans after the, story, the discovery of Troy by Heinrich Schliemann, uh, and he thought he had discovered the Palace of Gnosis, um, which is from the, the Greek myth of the Minotaur. Now, we don't know if this is actually the Minoan culture from... Uh, ancient from ancient Greek mythology. We, in fact, there's a lot we don't know about this culture. Uh, we do have two kinds of writing, Linear A and Linear B. Linear B has been translated, but Linear A still uh, remains mostly untranslated. This is another seafaring culture, and there is evidence of trade and interaction with the surrounding culture, so Egypt, Mesopotamia, etc., all the sort of usual suspects. You are looking at an image of a bull-headed from found from the, the city of Gnosis. 
Uh, a riton is a kind of ceremonial drinking vessel used for libations in ceremonies or in f uh, funerary practices, making liquid offerings for the dead. So you're familiar with this term by now, libation. The bull is inherent to the story of the Minotaur. The story is that there is a king named Minos, and he's told by and that he will be made king uh, of Crete by the god Poseidon. If he, if he will sacrifice this divine bull given to him by the god, uh, Minos decides to keep the bull and sacrifices a normal bull instead. Poseidon, in most legends, although sometimes it's Aphrodite, is upset by this and makes um, Minos' wife go crazy, and she falls in love. She desires this bull, the queen uh, Pacify. So Pacify becomes pregnant and gives birth to a minotaur, this creature who is half man and half bull. Uh, King Minos orders the labyrinth to hold this beast. The minotaur is offered annual sacrifices of youth from Athens to appease this creature. Theseus, son of King Aegeus of Athens, volunteers to be a sacrifice so he can prove himself to be a hero and kill the creature. Along the way, Minos's daughter Ariadne and Phaedra fall in love with Theseus. Daedalus gives Ariadne a ball of string to give to Theseus. Uh, Theseus kills the Minotaur, but doesn't get lost in this maze, uh, this labyrinth that he is kept in uh, because of this string um, given to him by Ariadne. He leaves Crete with both daughters, returning to Athens, but he dubs Ariadne on the way for her sister Phaedra. Ariadne runs off with the god Dionysus. Theseus returns to Athens, but in his sort of hubris, in his in his forgetfulness, in his his sort of sense of, of pride. He forgets to change the sails from black to white, signaling that he is victorious. So his father, King Aegeus, thinks that this is a, a funerary vessel or a message of the death of his son, and the King Aegeus throws himself into the Aegean Sea, giving it his name. And this is what was thought was discovered. And the reason this was, it was thought that this was the legendary palace of Knossos, the home of King Minos and the Minotaur, is because the way the palaces look. In fact, there are several quote-unquote palaces, and I say palaces loosely, because these aren't, these aren't probably palaces, they're more like uh, conglomerated cities, or these sort of large urban structures where there would have been lots of different different people living, um, and shops, and storage units, and um, ceremonial places all sort of lumped in together. There's, there's several of these cities on Crete, so there's one at Knossos, there's some others we're going to be looking at shortly. Uh, but because of the sort of confusing labyrinth-like uh, arrangement of these buildings, it looks like a maze, and this is why um, Sir Arthur Evans thought, aha, we have discovered Gnosis. We don't know that. Is there a relation to this palace in, in the Greek myth? M maybe, maybe. There's uh, some other things that connect it. The term labyrinth means double axe. Um, and there are, there's double axe imagery all over uh, Minoan culture. We don't know what these people called themselves, but we use the term Minoan anyway. But it's the, we see this double axe uh, motif all over Minoan culture. Uh, the term for this double axe is labrus, where we get the term labyrinth. Once again, here's a connection. We don't know how closely it connects, though. The Palace of Gnosis, um, once again, I'm, I'm going to use that term palace, although this is not actually a palace per se. This palace is different than a lot of the other cultures that we have been studying because of its almost seemingly random sort of layout. But also there is a, a lack of protection here. There aren't large fortified walls. There aren't the kinds of typical things we see that let us know that this is a um, culture uh, who is at war or who is often at war. Um, this seems to be, by its art, by the architecture of the ancient Minoans, to be a relatively peaceful culture because of the lack of sort of the normal kinds of armaments and, and architecture or protection we normally associate with ancient cultures. In fact, it's a very open um, the architecture seems to be very open with large windows, large passageways, uh, sort of air vents uh, to allow for the flow of air, uh, etc., etc. One of the key sort of elements of Minoan architecture is this tapered column. 
uh, column that starts wider at the top and tapers down to the bottom. The most of the columns here at the, at the Palace of Gnosis are made of stone. However, originally, the palace's columns were probably were made from wood and made from a tree that was flipped upside down so it would be more narrow at the bottom and wider at the top so when you use this sort of inverted, inverted tree. And there are some examples of this because we are actually looking at uh, what we call the New Palace period. The Minoan culture forms around 2000 BCE, but there is a, an earthquake probably, that destroyed the city and it was rebuilt. So what we're looking at is uh, is the new palace era, which was located on top of, and all the stuff was built sort of on top of, the old palace era. Uh, if you look at the bottom right, you can see this air shaft that allowed for ventilation. But you can see sort of how light and airy this entire architecture is. Where it's not like Egyptian architecture where we have to see the use of clerestory windows to allow in light. And Instead, we, the whole palace, quote-unquote palace, allows in sort of this flow of light and air. Another thing you will probably notice immediately is the use of color in Minoan art. Uh, this is one of the hallmarks of the culture. We often see these sort of pastel blues and greens, uh, and also pinks and, and sort of pale reds uh, dominate the decoration uh, of of Minoan culture. Uh, this is a seafaring people, uh, and so it's appropriate that the sort of color palette of Minoan culture reflects it, the seafaring uh, culture that it was. If you look at the image on the left, this is an image we call La Parisienne. This is either an image of a woman or a goddess. We're not quite certain. La Parisienne means the Par Parisian woman. There was no Paris in 1500 BC. This is a name uh, given around the time of Sir Arthur Evans' discovery of Minoan culture. This has nothing to do with Paris, but the sort of elegant nature of this young woman, her sort of fashionable kind of appearance, earned this, this image the nickname of La Parisienne. But, you know, once again, this is one of those names that has nothing to do with... It's sort of like our Venus of Willendorf. Uh, there's n there was no Willendorf and there was no Venus when that statue was discovered uh, or, or, or created in the Paleolithic era, and there was no Paris at the time of Minoan culture. On the, Im on the Im image on the right, we have three women here, the sort of reconstruction of of a fresco. Um, fresco is a kind of wall painting. If you'll notice the style of art, the way the figure is depicted here, it's very different than the way the Egyptian figures, uh, contemporary Egyptian figures, uh, would, would look. These are both from around the time of uh, what would be the New Kingdom in Egypt. So at this time, Egypt was still already very, very, very old. Yes, we see the composite figure. We see the head in profile. We see the eye on the side of the head sort of looking straight at us. Um, so this is contemporary. This is equivalent, I should say, to Egyptian art. However, Look at the curvilinear. Curvilinear means curving, uh, curvy line, literally, curvilinear uh, quality of the figures. These sort of tresses of hair that sort of curl down above the ear, this um, sort of curving line for, forming the nose and the chin. Gone are those sort of strong geometric forms of the Egyptian period, and we have a much sort of softer, lighter, I would say if uh, more elegant, in my own personal opinion, <laughs> uh, quality uh, than we would see in Egyptian art. The garments of the women where the breasts are bared. Um, we, we don't know if this was typical Minoan fashion or something related to a priestess class uh, sort of relating to fertility with the breasts, of course, having um, you know direct correlation with child rearing. Uh, we're not exactly sure, but it, it is a prevalent motif. But images of women in Minoan culture are distinctive and fascinating. Um, we, we can determine female figures from male figures by their coloring. Women are always uh, shown as being pale white, whereas men are shown uh, having darker brown skin. This is, this is an artistic device for telling um, 
men from women, from separating genders. Um, it might be a reference to uh, the fact that maybe women spend a lot of time indoors and men tend to work outside, but that is just an educated guess. But it is in this image that something else fascinating will reveal itself about women in Minoan art, is that we see them often in positions of power. Now, in, in Mesopotamian art, we never see women in positions of power. In Egyptian art, certainly. Um, well, we saw a, a female pharaoh, but she is often depicted as a man or her sexuality is, uh, her, uh, is, is downplayed. But here in Minoan art, with the exposed breast, of course, uh, we are in no doubt of, of what uh, sex we are seeing here. But what I find fascinating about this image is, well, first of all, we're looking at some sort of ritual, probably, some sort of ceremony. And we see a woman in the front uh, holding, literally, she has the bull by the horns. Um, bulls, as we know, are symbols of masculine power. And we see this woman literally grabbing the bull by the horns, sort of steadying and, con steadying and controlling this powerful male animal. We see the other figure on the right, um, sort of either about to catch or throwing this male figure. So we see women in a position of control, women in a position of power, and sort of this, the, the male figures in both the bull and the human male, uh, not necessarily subservient, but certainly um, not in a dominant position. Now, does this mean that women had more power in, in Minoan society? I have no earthly idea. We don't know. Um, the writing is, uh, that we have is limited, and there's one script that we haven't even yet deciphered at all. So we don't, we don't know. Um, and you, know, you also got to keep in mind that it's, it's difficult to base our knowledge of how people behaved and how, their, how they socialized and how their social structures were set up based on art alone. If we, if we based, for example, the ancient Greeks alone on how they depicted women, then we would think very often that women were, had a very powerful role in Greek society because we see images of strong goddesses, for instance, like Athena. But we know that, that uh, women through most periods of Greek history were treated either rather poorly and treated as property or, or had very limited interaction with the population at large. So we can't always base on what we what we see and and think that sort of uh, extrapolates to how the society functions. But this is fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> uh, to see these kinds of images of women in power um, is, is very rare in the ancient world. Take a look again at the color palette, these pale blues and, and pinks and sort of uh, maritime colors uh, dominate. This is a Buon fresco. A Buon fresco means true fresco, I should say, uh, but it, it's a wet fresco. A Buon fresco, um, the plaster is, is mixed with the pigment and applied wet onto the surface. In a fresco secco or a dry fresco, plaster is dry when the pigment is placed on it. It's not as durable uh, as a Buon fresco or a, or, a, or a true fresco or a wet fresco. Speaking of frescoes, uh, this comes from a place called Akrotiri. Uh, you can see those hallmarks of Minoan culture. You can see that curvilinear quality in the line. Uh, you can see those sort of pastel uh, maritime colors. Um, and it's a very different organic is the word, uh, as opposed to geometric, organic quality to the, the design of the imagery here that is in stark contrast to pretty much every culture we have studied. Minoan uh, religion, you no, know, they were a funerary culture, they did make offerings to the dead, but we don't see large-scale tombs like we do in Egypt. That being said, we do have some sarcophagi. A sarcophagi is a large stone container uh, where a coffin, or sometimes a series of coffins, as we saw in ancient Egypt, would be placed. This is a sarcophagus uh, from a place called Hagia Triada. If you look along the two sides, you will see the sort of swirling pattern uh, around circling what is called a rosette. A rosette is a a floral form. It means literally little rose. This sort of swirling pattern represents swirling water. Uh, so once again, a reference to the sea. 
if you look at the central image, this long uh, rectangular uh, procession of people here, on the far left you can see a, a sort of doorway or holding an altar. And between these two pillars, at the top of the pillars, are is that double axe motif um, that I told you would, would, would be there. You axed for it, right? And there it is. If you look, uh, there is one of our uh, priestess figures that we have seen now several times making a, an offering of a libation, a liquid offering, pouring it into what is called a crater, K-R-A-T-E-R. -E you will see that word again this chapter. A crater as they pour water into uh, the container here. In fact, there's several lined up, men and women. Once again, we can tell the men from the women by this coloring of their skin. Uh, if we look at the three men on the right, we see they are making offerings of animals, probably sacrificial offerings, uh, although the last is holding a model of a boat. If you look at the far right, you can see the image of the dead. Uh, this is our our elite member of Minoan society. He is separated from the rest by the way he looks and also by this sort of plant uh, and, a, and a, um, a staircase or a wall um, down here at the bottom that is meant to separate him um, from the world of the living. This is a device that we have seen several times before all the way back to ancient Sumer, but this need to sort of divide the live in the spaces of the living and the dead, or even the sacred and the secular, and the secular from each other. Uh, he is standing in front of another doorway, once again representing this concept of the afterlife. But you'll see that in size, he is smaller. He is diminished compared to this the size of those around him. And uh, he appears very un human almost. He appears more like a statue or a pillar with a bust of a person on top. Um, there is a lot of care taken here to to separate him as a living person to show us that we are looking at the dead. If we look at the other side, we see an altar here in the center with a cow uh, or a bull, I should say, um, tied up uh, onto the altar. Um, so this was meant to be, this is a sacrificial bull. And below we also see some images of some goats which were also probably sacrificed. Uh, we see uh, an image on the left of a woman holding the bull steady. So this is harkens back to our leaping bull fresco that we saw earlier. Uh, we can also see the distinctive Minoan style in their pottery. Um, on the right, we have what is called a Camares ware, named for the cave in which it was found. This is from the earliest period of Minoan civilization, what we call the Old Palace, before the earthquake destroyed uh, the first phase of Minoan's um, construction. We can see that at this early stage, there are, is a use of registers, uh, uh, especially the bottom part of this jar. Uh, we see these kind of strict registers, although we still see this reference to um, organic or uh, water style forms with these waves at the bottom and then their swirling water motif here. And then of course the fish uh, as we see in almost this kind of yin-yang pattern. Even though this is a sort of more organic and sort of softer kind of decorative design than we would see in other cultures. There are still, um, you can still see the influence of Egypt and Mesopotamia and other cultures uh, on, on um, Minoan pottery here. But if we look at the image on the left, you're going to see something like we haven't seen before yet. Um, look at that octopus. Uh, I love this octopus, I've got to tell you guys. Uh, look at the way he's burst out of the registers. There are no registers. Uh, in fact, uh, it's almost as if the, the decorator of this pot, the painter of this pot, um, used the, the shape of the pot to determine how the octopus was going to look. And so its tentacles kind of trace the outline, the form of this pot. So instead of sort of being kind of hemmed in by these strict registers, this octopus is sort of more free form and organic in quality. Um, 
and and the the potter really took advantage of the shape of this pot to sort of emphasize the sort of loose quality of the tentacles and the octopus here. Uh, I also think this is painted with a little bit of maybe humor, uh, but certainly there the the, the qualities of Minoan. Um, pottery and decoration is is very different than the rest of the Mediterranean world that we have been studying so far. And the image on the right is made from a material called faience, which is a sort of low-fired ceramic glaze, basically a glass that has been placed onto a clay surface. This is a very early version of glass, and in fact it was invented by the Egyptians, so once again there's our Egyptian connection. We see an image of a snake goddess, and I find this image remarkable because we are seeing something we don't often see. Um, we are seeing our good old heraldic figure, remember that? A central figure. On either hand, we have a powerful animal. In this case, we have snakes. Sitting on top of the uh, woman's head is a cat, a, um, a, a predator that hunts snakes. So th th we have the control of the snake and this predatory animal that destroys snakes. So we're looking at an image of power, an image of power over nature. You can see the bared breast that, we, that we've talked about before. So this is probably a priestess figure. Once again, what were their functions? What were women's function in, in Minoan society? We don't know. Did w women have a certain kind of power in M Minoan society? No idea. This is a um, Minoan po example of Minoan pottery. This is called the harvester vase. Uh, this is not made from uh, clay, but this is actually made from a stone uh, called steatite, which was carved away. So first of all, look at the overlap. We are looking at a bunch of figures, a bunch of men who have finished working in the fields. They had sheaths of wheat over their shoulders and implements, pitchforks, things like that, farming implements, over their shoulders as they walk home. Um, look at the almost chaotic nature of of these men. So gone are the strict registers. Gone is that sort of Egyptian quality of figures not often touching or overlapping. And instead we see this kind of jumble, this mass of humanity that we haven't seen before in ancient art. Um, but it is not only sort of the different sizes and shapes of people too that I find interesting about this. This kind of not not everybody looks alike and not everybody's the same size. Uh, or we're not looking at hieratic scale here too to show one person more important than the other. Um, the people who are taller are taller because they're actually taller in real life. So we have a naturalism here, right? Um, <coughs> but also what I find fascinating is the emotion. We haven't seen emotion like this. We can feel joy in, in, in the movement uh, of these men. The guy, the central figure down here is singing. In fact, this whole group of men in the middle are singing. And we can see this man exerting air through, you know, out of his mouth, um, pushing air from his mouth. We can see his rib cage expand and contract as he sings this working song or this going home song uh, that all these men are joining in on. So this, we are, we are seeing naturalism. Uh, we are seeing uh, um, people, we are seeing artists really, really observing the way human beings look and the way their anatomy works and, and using that to express emotion in the figures themselves. We're seeing personality in a way that we have rarely seen, except for maybe in the Amarna period in ancient Egypt. Uh, we are seeing personality in arts that is rare in the ancient world. We're going to wrap up our discussion of the Aegean with one final culture, uh, the Mycenaean culture. This is another uh, place that is in the Homeric epics. Homeric means relating to Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, the Mycenaean culture uh, existed towards the end of the um, Minoan culture, and there are some similarities between the two, but also some very strong differences. Uh, you're looking uh, at, a, at a map of a citadel uh, called Tiryns. Here we have a very structured citadel. Uh, so this tells us that this is a, a, a culture that was often at war. They had to protect themselves uh, from their enemies. They didn't necessarily have the natural protections of being an island culture that we did in Crete. So 
uh, this is a culture that had to build walls without the natural protection. It is these walls that are, that are some of the most distinctive parts of Mycenaean architecture. Uh, they are made up of these cut large rocks that we call Cyclopean, because the ancient Greeks saw these old fortresses and they thought they were built by the Cyclops. Uh, the Cyclops, of course, are large giants with one eye in the center of their head uh, that are from Greek mythology, and they're sort of at the very foundation of the Greek um, uh, foundation myths. And they thought that these were constructed at the dawn of time. These ancient Greeks thought these Cyclops, who were the only things large enough that could lift these large rocks, built these massive fortresses. You are looking at a uh, basically a walkway in one of the fortified walls. So these walls were really hollow, so archers and, uh, could shoot arrows from, from the walls, but also you could walk around inside the walls and be protected. The top of the... Uh, the passageway is where I want you to direct your interest. Uh, this is called a corbelled arch. Um, there's three basic techniques of forming a ceiling out of stone in the ancient world. Post and lentil, which is the oldest and we've already seen, think Stonehenge. Uh, and then we'll see the arch, um, especially when we get to Rome, we'll see the arch. But uh, in Mycenae, uh, this technique called corbeling was used, or a corbeled arch, which is sort of a triangular-shaped arch. Uh, these Basically, you're relying on the tension of the stones pressing against each other to... Um, make sure that the ceiling doesn't fall in. It is all based on the fact that these rocks are sort of jammed in tight and the pressure of the rocks allow uh, for the formation of the ceiling. We are looking at the entrance to the city of Mycenae itself. So we were in Tiryns, now we're in Mycenae. You're looking at a sort of large, um, or I'm sorry, I should say a long walkway leading into the gates of the city. So once again, this idea of protection, this idea of separating um, the, the, the city from the outside world for protection. We have our two uprights and our cross beams, so we have the post and lintel structure. And above that, we have something called a relieving triangle. Um, this was meant to help reduce the weight of these massive cyclopean stones on top of the post and lintel. Oftentimes in these relieving triangles, they can be just a hollow triangular window, or sometimes they can be filled with a relief sculpture, and that is the case here. We have an image of two lions whose heads have been removed by an ancient enemy. Does this look familiar? It should. It's our good old buddy, the heraldic form. Although instead of a person, um, like the woman holding snakes or the man holding the bulls together we saw in Sumerian culture, we see uh, two lions flanking a column. The column is meant to represent the state of Mycenae itself. This imposing image would be the first thing you would see as you walk towards the city. So you know that this is a city that is, is powerful, that has the ability to protect itself. The uh, Mycenaean cities were very structured, unlike the Minoan cities, which tend to be open and have sort of a large gathering of rooms that all kind of one led into the other, giving it this labyrinth-like appearance. What we see here is a very regimented um, layout. In fact, you could only get to certain buildings by going through other certain buildings, so that means that your access was controlled. The central building which uh, sat the leader of the Mycenaean people was called a Megaron. The center of the palace was also a ceremonial place with a large fire pit in the center where uh, burnt offerings could be made to a god or a goddess. If you look, though, at the reconstruction of this image, though, you can see that it is heavily influenced by Minoan culture. The Mycenaean and Minoan cultures were very different from each other, but they were close. And in fact, towards the end of Minoan culture, the Mycenaeans controlled them. They copied the Minoan culture heavily. You can see that in the use of this sort of swirling pattern that we have talked about, this sort of water form. Uh, you can see it in the use of, of Buon frescoes. Uh, you can see it in the use of the color choices, these sort of light maritime type 
uh, colors, blues and, and pale pinks and oranges and things like that. Um, in the right, you can actually see the shield in the shape of the double axe, the labrys, uh, which is inherent in Minoan culture. And also see, uh, if you look here at the top, the image of the rosette, which is all over my uh, Sunni, uh, Minoan culture. But these are very different cultures. One is kind of a militaristic culture, the Mycenaeans. The other isn't. There was more delineation between classes of people in Mycenaean culture. We can tell by the way they were buried. Um, there's a lot more sort of exclusive grave sites. One of the biggest grave sites is in the city of Mycenae. There is a, a place called Grave Circle A where there were, I believe, six large tombs found uh, with bodies of the elite. Uh, who were buried with elaborate grave goods. So we're looking at something that's a lot more like ancient Egypt in a way, where we have this, this society with sort of strict social structures. And you are looking at a tomb. Although the, the text at the bottom of the image says this is a treasury of Atreus. Atreus is a figure from Greek mythology related to the Trojan War. But this is not a treasury. This is a tomb. A tomb of an elite person, but we don't know who is buried here. There is a long entrance entryway, uh, over 100 feet long, leading up to this tomb. The gateway to the tomb is about 16 feet tall. The tomb in total is over 30 some odd feet tall. There is a relieving triangle above the post lentil structure forming the gateway into the tomb. So here's our good old relieving triangle. There would have been an image in here, but it is now long gone. What makes this tomb important is its shape. Uh, this is the largest dome of the ancient world up until the Roman Empire. This is a dome that was that is something like 34 feet tall. This is a special kind of tomb called a tholos, um, or sometimes you'll hear the term beehive tomb because the shape of the tomb sort of reflects a beehive. This would have been filled with grave goods, however that stuff is long gone, but the nature of this tomb, the this construction design of it is, is, is what's important and makes it significant. The fact that it is the largest dome of the ancient world before ancient Rome. There was nothing in the world like this. Uh, so this is an incredible architectural achievement. And a dome works in very much the same way that corbeling works. It requires on the pressure from each stone um, next to each other. Basically, it, it holds itself together through this tremendous amount of pressure. Um, the kinds of stuff we see in Mycenaean tombs. Well, here's one from Mycenae itself. Uh, this is from one of those six shafts. This uh, was when it was discovered by Heinrich Schliemann. It was thought to be the mask of Agamemnon, the leader of the Greeks in the Trojan War. It is not. We don't know who this was. We do know this was an elite member of the society. This is a solid gold funerary mask. So just like the Egyptians placed masks over their dead, so too did the Mycenaean uh, culture. Uh, this is used a technique called reposé. Reposé is a hammering technique. So you hammer uh, the metal to form an image. And um, what we are seeing here is the image of a, an elite figure from Mycenaean society. Um, this is a very, this also is a testament to the incredible skills of Mycenaean metal workers. The fact that this um, gold was able to be beaten. Gold is, is, is a material that warms up fairly quickly and hammering it causes friction, which causes heat, which um, makes the metal very thin and very difficult to work with. So you're looking at a very high level of craftsmanship here. And so finally, the last thing I want to take a look at is a, a comparison between the, the, the crater that we saw earlier, and I apologize for the typo on the left. Uh, that's not crate hyphen, it should be crater. Um, uh, this harvest crater we saw earlier in Minoan culture compared with a crater from uh, Mycenae, a warrior's vase. So once again, the subject matter should tell you we're looking at two very different cultures. One, the militaristic 
uh, imagery on the right of the Mycenaean and, and the sort of peacetime culture, uh, the culture of agriculture and harvest on the left with the Minoan image. You can also see, even though there is a Minoan influence in the imagery of the soldiers on the right with their sort of curvilinear quality, but uh, the use of strict registers, this has more of an Egyptian influence in its overall design than it does have a Minoan influence. You know, it's easy to sort of say, well, the sort of strict nature of the militaristic society in the Mycenaean play out in this sort of strict composition of the, the, the crater here of this, of this vase. And, and that very well might be true, but we also got to be need, we need to be careful about drawing too many conclusions. Uh, like earlier when we saw the images of women of power, we don't know if that directly correlates to women actually having power, power in Minoan society. And so we don't know how much the militarism of the imagery of Mycenae here infiltrated sort of day-to-day -day life in Mycenaean society. But you are looking at two styles that we see significant overlap, uh, but also significant difference. And so that is the end of our discussion of Aegean culture. I will see all of you in the next video. Take care.